Now we're going to have a look at what a shallow water blackout is. The thing about shallow water blackout is it does happen in shallow water even though you're deep. It's not like you're just diving in five meters and then you come up and you black out. No, that is possible. So now there is a level and everyone's got a personal one and uh, of where the body goes, not enough oxygen, I'm taking control. Knocks you out. Dive within your own known capabilities. So if you're used to diving 16 metres and now you find you're out in 20 metres and the people who are getting fish are in 20 metres, now you really have to be serious about what you're going to do there. Make sure that your partner is being responsible for you. Look after me on this dive. I'm not sure on this depth. You know, be honest. Or you know this guy hasn't dived that big. You say, oh, look, we're in 20 metres today, uh, you know, on this, on this particular spot. Um, how do you feel about that? And get the guy to talk. Oh, yeah, I'll be right. I'll, and, but make the deal you're going to be looked after. So within your known capabilities, the point being here is these change. Making allowances for dehydration, being sick, oh, I had the flu last week. Easy to just, ah, oh, had the flu last week. Get in the water and you see the fish down 20 metres. You know. so you've, got to, you've got to be smart about that. Um, hangovers. Hangovers is usually dehydration. The body's in a, in a bad situation when it's dehydrated. You will get a shorter dive time by far. Okay? Lack of sleep. How often do we stay up getting our gear ready at 11 o'clock at night and then you're up at 3 or 4 in the morning? See, that's a, that's, and it's an easy one to miss, you know? Four hours sleep isn't enough. And another one is lack of fitness. We're the weekend warriors, you know? Spearfishing is a sport that demands fitness. Any sport to do well, you're going to have to train. You're not going to train on the same stuff as a freediver who's training for a single deep dive. You're going to train on completely different situations, okay? If you're training for spearfishing, you're not training on a single deep dive, you're training on multiple dives. A person who's dive fit will have good cardio, he'll do a little bit of cardio from now and then, you know? Maybe a, if I'm doing it, and I do an eight-week program, I do two to three weeks of fairly good cardio before I start going on to my longer dives. But then when I go on to the longer dives, I move off the cardio, and I start doing... Uh, things that are going to lower my heart rate. So you've got to train in such a way you can slow your heart down. And the way to do that in the pool, laps. Underwater laps. Getting used to doing multiple laps over a night, you know, where you're kicking slow and just working it through. One thing you can do, is which one of the ones that I like doing, is 25 metres with a rest at one end and then 25 back. So you swim 25 underwater, Keep holding your breath, stop, and then you swim 25 back, and then come up and breathe. This is a great exercise because it approximates, without the depth, waves, and currents, and things like that, it approximates a 25 metre dive in distance and time. So you start off doing it, first of all, you've got to make sure you're quite happy doing the 50, 25 there and 25 back. Well, the next thing you do, 25 there and a 10 second delay. Then you do, you know, do that two or three nights in a night, watched all the time because this is new, and you make sure you do small increments of change. As soon as you try and jump up large increments of change, you're liable to run adrift. Get to know your body. When do you get contractions? This is a great thing on training. Uh, for example, at first you might do a 50 underwater and you get contractions when you get to about 25 or 40 or whatever. Uh, get to know when you get your contractions and build up slowly after that just you know working nice and gradually and you'll find that your contractions will start sitting around something mine still sit after 10 12 years of free dive training I still get my first contraction between 70 and 80 meters if I'm in the water um, in a pool distance wise I get my first good contraction there sometimes it's earlier but that's generally where it is and if you're only doing increments at a time, watching your buddy, you come up and he sees you like this, you tell your buddy, you were close to me. There's nothing quite like a person knowing that he's got close and coming through to let him know that he is mortal. And move away from that young, 
never been tested person who's doing really well, getting great fish, thinking he can't go wrong. As soon as someone says, you are actually close then, all of a sudden you're like, whoa. You know? That means it could happen to me. And that's really good for someone. So training, controlled training, is good for you. So let's have a quick look at uh, recognising when something goes wrong. So the buddy's down there diving. You want to be able to know when to, when to do something, when to get ready. And there are some real little telltale things. Of course, it really helps if you know what your buddy looks like underwater. You've seen them come up so many times. So if you've got a regular buddy, that really helps. The things that you look for, and usually the first action that happens, is there's a change of pace or style in their kick. This is even before they start sambering or blacking out. So they're coming up, and all of a sudden the kick doesn't look quite so effective. Instead of having a nice flick out here, it sort of maybe half moves or gets a little bit uncoordinated. And, and you're going, going, oh, what's happening? At that point, if you see a change like that and your buddy coming up off the bottom there, well, you get ready straight away. He may come up, not be a problem. So next thing that usually happens is the kick will go to hell. Especially if, you know, if they don't make the surface, all of a sudden they will be moving their legs. It's not even getting to the fins. And they'll start sambering underwater. That's usually the sort of thing that will happen. At that point, you just go straight down there. And I'll tell you how to grab them in a minute. The other thing that happens is they'll come right to the surface, as we saw in that one there, and then... It takes about between 8 and 10 seconds for the first breath of air to get the oxygen through to the brain. So a person could come up, and if he's really close, he could come up, get a good breath even, still, blah, 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 and then come out of it. And I've seen people do that. They get a good breath of air, they start sambering, they might even disqualify themselves in a competition by their airways going below, but they've managed to get out of it. Why? Because they got a good breath of air when they first come up. But quite often when a person starts sambering, it's loss of motor control. It means the loss of motor control on the lungs as well. And quite often they haven't quite got the coordination to have a breath of air. So they come up and they just start going down. They roll over, their eyes will roll. It's a you know, pretty horrible sort of thing when you see it. The main thing is you're watching the guy come off the, foot, off the bottom or come up into visibility. There's one thing that we do a lot in Queensland, more so here than New South Wales, and that's we dive with reels with no floats. Not all of us. A lot of people just do the floats and that, and that's great, you know. But diving with a reel on a gun and no float, we're not even looking at getting cleaned up by a boat. It has the problems. If it, you know, it's kind of good if you're at 20 metres and you've got 25 metres viz, or, you know, it's very clear and you can watch right throughout the dive. Easy. Just keep an eye on them, you know, and you'll know when he's in problems because you clearly see him. But what if you're in 20 metres and you've got 10 metres viz? And he's got a real gun. And he goes down, and you're watching, he's going that way. And you go, okay, I'm ready, I'm looking after my buddy, and he sees a fish over there. And he goes over there, that fish swims away, now he sees it in the back, or coming out behind it. So he turns around and he goes there. Okay, he overstays. You're kind of like going, yeah, I'm waiting, I'm ready for him. He comes up behind you, it's a bit of a chop. You don't immediately see him, maybe you don't do that. He struggles, he could drown. Just because you don't know he's come up and he's had problems here. Going 10 metres viz, 20 metres, put a ridge line on. And then what you do, if the guy goes down, you follow the ridge line. You know he's going to be somewhere out there. You might see it curl around there. He might be up there, 10 metres or 15 metres in front of you. You're going to have a fair idea. But then if he does a smart thing and comes back up his ridge line, so you know you're going to miss. See? So those little things you organise early, before you dive, these things are going to make it so much safer. Yes. So the first thing, the first and foremost when you grab someone and you're moving them up is to get their airways out of the water. Airways out, mask off. You're going to tell them to breathe. So you've got to make sure his airways stay out of water. Now, this can be in a chop. And this has happened. 
You say, breathe, and he goes, just as the wave goes over the top of his head. Now, that is not a good thing to allow happen. So you've really got to get your, your, your act together. So that's why you drill it. So you can. You see this wave coming up? You push them up at that particular time. You're ready for it, you know? Because all you're thinking, those airways can't go back underwater because now you're telling him to breathe. He's going to trust you. He's going to do what you say, but you cannot let him breathe in water. So breathe, lift his airways up out of the water. So the majority of it happens as he's coming up. And so... You've got to get hold of them. But there's a way to do it. And the best way to do it here is like that. You support them behind the neck. You're controlling them now. You can make them do whatever you want. You hold the mask onto his face at this point in time. The underwater. You've got your arms here. Now the only thing on top, once you've got hold of them and you're starting to direct them, Push your hands up a little bit here. And what that does is clear his fins away from your own. When you get them up to the surface here, your first port of call is to get the mask off him. The reason being is you want the wind on his face. You've got these nerves all around here. And when you haven't got, when they're you know, covered up, they don't let the person know that he's on the surface. So here we go, up here, you take the mask off. Now he's leaning back slightly, you're supporting him, lift the mask off like that. Now I suggest that you hold. Now sometimes people get up there and they just take the mask off and it flies over there. Now you've got to realise, this is a bit funny, you've got to realise he won't remember. All you'll know is you've lost his mask. <laughs> So it's one of the things to practice, it's here, you've got your hand there, and you slip it over like that. Okay, so it's usually back like that, okay, what do you do now? You tell them to breathe. Funny, the last thing that goes, when a person goes unconscious, is his hearing. You won't be able to see anymore, you won't be able to, you won't feel much, but you can still communicate to them. And all you have to do is tell them very directly, but not panicky, very directly, tell them to breathe. And it's amazing what happens. You can be holding them there, and you just look at them and you go, come on, Gareth, breathe. Come on, mate, breathe. You relax, it's not heavy, don't you? A couple of people go, breathe, breathe. You know, just panic. And you know what happens to the guy who's blacked out? He just stays blacked out. It's the, you know, the current environment is too upsetting for him to come out. You just... The other thing that people do is they slap them. <laughs> We've found that the best bet, you just tell them to breathe and you tap or rub. All you're doing there is you're bringing their attention back to their body. They're a little bit... And I would, I've talked to people who have... Just grab a seat on. Thanks, Lawrence. I've talked to people who have blacked out and asked them what it was like. One guy, he says, I just went away to this nice field. He says he felt it was warm, he could smell the hay. That's where he went. So <clears throat> you've got to get him out of there. And you can't do that by shocking him. So usually that's enough. And I've seen time and time again, they just go, hmm, oh, oh, what's happening? You know? uh, if it's a little bit resistant, you can blow air onto their face. Quite often when you're out in the ocean, you've already got wind on your face, so it's actually doing it anyway. But it stimulates the nerves. Okay. Now there's one other thing that you need to know here, and that is uh, if he's not coming around and he's not taking a breath, very often this glottis, epiglottis, or the thing that, <coughs> that thing that controls your breathing is locked closed, spasmed closed. It's a great thing. It's a fantastic automatic thing that stops water going into your lungs and saves so much problem. Because sometimes you can get a person up, and this has happened in the past, you know, he's been down on the bottom for a minute. You get him up, and he still hasn't got any water in his lungs. Why? Because he spasmed and it closed up. But you can have the guy there, and his epiglottis is closed, and he's not breathing, and you might find him struggling a little bit. Well, at that point, you need to do a rescue breath. Now, this isn't mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. This is just one rescue breath, maybe two. 
And what it does is it opens the area and makes uh, and brings him into the time that he feels like he has to breathe. It forces air in there, and it'll often just go bam, and he'll come straight out of it. Now, if by some chance he doesn't come round then, you keep doing that, and you get him to the boat, or you get him to shore. Something else is going on. It's quite possible the guy had a heart condition beforehand, and he's gone into cardiac arrest or something like that. So it would be something else that you don't know. Because what you've done, you've done the thing that will bring that person around. And you can be confident. And if it doesn't happen, well, at that point, you go, right, to the boat, he's got to get medical help right now. And you've got to know your CPR then. However, you're going to find what I've shown you now with the talk, call him his name, tell him to breathe, tap or touch, and blow on his face. Okay, so those are the main things. Final thing is a rescue breath. All right, okay, that's the end of the information night. Help yourself to the, the water and the goodies and uh, any questions you have for me later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.